Well, hey there, idiots. Welcome back to Observe. And in today's video, we're going to be analyzing the nonverbal communication of Alec Baldwin in regards to the Rust tragedy that happened in 2021. More on that in just a second, but on a more lighthearted note, happy 2022. I hope you're having a great year these few days so far in, and it's exciting to be able to see you with this first video. In light of it being a new year, a couple things to announce pretty shortly here is that I want to let you know that I'm going to be more active over on my other channel. For those of you who don't know, I have another channel. I have more facets to me than just the nonverbal communication. I do a lot of videography, cinematography, short films, and just pretty much anything else that I have as far as hobbies or desires that I want to do go over there. Along with that, Megan, my wife, she also has been pushing hard on her channel and you'll be seeing a lot more quality content coming out on there as well. So if you wanna check that one out. Uh, those are the kind of checkout things that will be going on here during 2022. Very excited for it. I think that's enough talking about all the various things though. Let's go ahead and roll the intro and then we'll dive right into a timeline of Alec. In 1993, Alec Baldwin married a co-star from his prior movie named Kim Bassinger. Then in 1995, Baldwin was alleged to have beat a photographer after he followed Baldwin and Bassinger and their infant daughter. Not only were there said to be blows, but according to reports, Baldwin went so far as to spray the photographer with shaving cream. In 2002, Baldwin and Bassinger split in divorce. It was stated that Baldwin was ordered to go to anger management classes and take a parenting course in order to get phone call privileges with his daughter. More on that in a moment. In 2003, Baldwin filed court papers against Bassinger for allegedly violating court orders about his visits with his daughter. However, according to New York Magazine, he eventually dropped the charges. Later in 2007, Baldwin made international news when an audio sample of a voicemail rant to his 11-year-old daughter, Ireland, was leaked. In the message, he exploded in frustration after she missed a scheduled phone call with him, which was part of their visitation. He called her a rude, thoughtless little pig amidst other equally distasteful statements. During this time, Baldwin was in the middle of a three-year custody battle with his ex-wife, Bassinger, for Ireland. Later on in 2011, he had an unpleasant interaction with an American Airlines associate when he was kicked off a flight for poor behavior. Allegedly, a flight attendant had asked Baldwin to turn off his phone and he rudely refused, took his phone into the laboratory, slammed the door and locked himself in there. Later, he claimed that he was playing words with friends and that he was singled out because of who he was and that flying had become like a Greyhound bus experience for him. He had also attempted to shift the blame of his actions to the attendant's tone for getting the best of him. In 2012, a photographer filed criminal charges against Baldwin for punching him and shoving him after he had taken pictures of Baldwin and his fiancée outside the courthouse. Later in 2013, Baldwin's newly debuted talk show was canceled after only five episodes. Reports say that the decision had to do something with yet another of Baldwin's tirades at a photographer. However, this time he hurled homophobic slurs and the entire scene was caught on tape by TMZ. He also released a slew of homophobic tweets to a reporter who had falsely reported that Baldwin's wife had been on social media during a funeral. Still in 2013, he attacked a photographer who had been following them, and within the same year, he was accused by TMZ of assaulting and using racial slurs against another photographer. Baldwin denied the claims and took the position of the thought of him saying something so ignorant and terrible to be one of the most outrageous things he had heard in his life. In 2014, Baldwin was arrested and charged with disorderly conduct after he got belligerent with two police officers who had stopped him for riding his bicycle illegally the wrong direction down a street. He was cuffed 
and taken later to the station. In 2016, he sued an art gallery owner for selling him a counterfeit painting. The owner responded by clarifying that the painting was quite real and that Baldwin had oddly waited around six years before bringing up any complaints about the piece and that he had dodged roughly $16,000 in sales tax during the transaction when he had purchased it. All fascinating things. Later on in 2017, we saw Baldwin in a public argument regarding him knowingly filming an adult scene with a 16-year-old girl when he himself would have been around 48 at the time. He denied having any idea of her age before the shoot. Later on in 2020, Baldwin was announced to be starring as the lead role in a film he was also producer of called Rust. It was to be a Western piece set in the 1800s and was intended to be a drama and action-filled film. When asked by The Hollywood Reporter how confident he was in his skills of horseback riding and familiarity with firearms, he responded, quote, They're always ready. I'm an actor of the old school, so if you read my resume, my motorcycle riding, my French juggling, my horseback riding, my gunplay, is all right at my fingertips, at all times. Later on in 2021, this brings us to the incident itself. On Thursday, October 21st of 2021, Alec Baldwin fired a prop gun that injured the director and killed their DP, Helena Hutchins. Hutchins was a talented cinematographer who had originally come from the Ukraine. She had been updating her social media followers during the days leading up to her tragic death. Baldwin is facing heat surrounding the circumstances that led up to this loss and accusations of cutting budgetary corners, ignoring safety protocols, understaffing, overworking, and underproviding for the crew members have become public. In response to the outrage, Baldwin released an interview addressing the matters. That is what we will be looking at today, will be that interview. We'll pour through every bit of it that we can and talk about it at the very end with some of the details where we can hopefully find some direction on this. I think that's enough talking. I think that's enough backstory. It is time to begin into the actual read. Bones are off, let me get slate. Marker, good. good. Any more? I do want to note real quick, just for those of you watching and interested in the video editing portion of this, I have flipped it, cropped it in some, and added some other things, as you can see, to hopefully circumvent some of the copyright issues that I continually run into on this channel. So hopefully, hopefully you're seeing this. If you're not, I'm talking to no one right now. And if you are, that means that this was hopefully at least somewhat, somewhat reliable. But I just wanted to make note of that. Let's go ahead and continue forward. Alec, thank you for doing this. You, you haven't said much in public since that tragic accident. Why, why speak out now? Well, I think that um, there's a criminal investigation. That could be a while. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start with something that I'll just note about the dynamic between these two, which is actually maybe, I don't know, it might be more reassuring for us to be able to see. So the interviewer says a greeting to Alec, and Alec does not respond on any level. And just take that as you will as to their dynamic. Perhaps Alec is just super somber here. It could be. He could also just be showing that he doesn't have a lot of respect or appreciation enough to respond to said interviewer. Even though they are rolling and this is going to be publicized, he still doesn't see fit to respond to the interviewer. It is a small little thing here, and it could be nothing at this point. I don't think it is because of some other things that play out later on in the interview, but I did want to make note of it this early on. Let's continue watching. Uh, there's all kinds of civil litigation, and I felt there were a number of misconceptions, most of it from sources I really wouldn't concern myself about, but a couple that I did concern myself about, where there were these authoritative statements about, this is what happened. The Sheriff's Department hasn't even released a report to the DA yet. 
just a second here. I'll comment on some of the content here in a second. Also on the side of ABC, this is heavily edited. I even while trying to gather this footage myself, I could see multiple and hear multiple times of where they have cut and spliced this interview kind of together. So that does raise some questions to me as far as how accurate I'm going to be like, what, what am I seeing here? Is it really his genuine reactions or has ABC just kind of fudged around with everything to make it more clickable? I'm not sure, it's difficult to say, but it is something that I want to be able to keep in mind because later on if we see something that might not align but should, then it, that could be it. It could be literally the editing and it didn't happen that way. Just wanted to make note of that. Also, now speaking as far as Alec and his nonverbal communication, we hear where his tone is lying. It's fairly low, fairly somber. We could also hear the flow of his words. He might be a little nervous early on here because it's the beginning of an interview and everybody is, but so far it sounds as though he's very evenly paced and his tone sounds rather steady. So this might be a, a, an early sign of a baseline for him, something that we need to pay attention to. Also noting non-verbally, he is leaning forward. He doesn't have open or closed body language, which is flexible in and of its interpretation, but he at least doesn't seem to be doing any overt closing or distancing gestures, which is good to see. Let's continue forward. The reason I wanted to sit down with you is because I really feel like I can't wait for that process to fit to end in February, March. I mean, I'm not asking them to speed it up for my benefit. That's ridiculous. But I am saying that they're going to do what they need to do. And I wanted to come to talk to you to say that I would go to any lengths to undo what happened. I would go to any lengths to undo what happened. I think the big question. Okay, so that's interesting. Just with his response with it, especially that repetition at the end, that would go to any lengths to undo what happened, I would go to any lengths to undo what happened. It's interesting, that repetition. And all that it's serving for right now is as a red flag for me. Why is he repeating that here? He really wants to hammer it home. Is there something that would push us to believe that he didn't want to go to any lengths to make or to allow that to happen? Like, is there something that is causing him to really try to convince us here? Yes, there is, and we know that, but that's popping up here. He's really trying to hammer it home. So I'm keeping an eye on that. And you know what? Uh, I'll, I'll reserve a lot of my opinions in regards to this entire scenario at the very, very end, which I do have some because I have been in cinematography circles and also as this as well. And yeah, there's some stuff, but we'll get to it. Let's continue watching this for now. And the one you must have asked yourself a thousand times, how could this have happened? Well, there's two things I want to say about that. One is that when I talk about this, so when he starts off, he has a much higher pitch and it has a much less force behind it. It has a, well, it's almost a croak again. This is an indicator of stress and agitation, obviously. How could this happen? And so this is a stressful and intense question. And that is the kind of question we would like to be able to hear. And he's showing agitation centered around this. And that, that loss of pressure behind, that loss of force behind there could be an indicator of a lack of sincerity or a lack of confidence. This is a nerve-wracking question, and he might not feel totally confident on it. Not enough to say quite yet, but it is still another thing that we've made note of as we continue forward. My concern is that I don't sound like I'm the victim. Because there is a victim. There's a woman who died. And my friend got shot. He's my friend. And she was a new friend. I met her and we worked together on the some of the mapping out of what we're going to do on the film, which, you know, in the movie terms, if you go make a movie with Scorsese, you and the DP don't sit down and they solicit your ideas of how to make Okay, so some notes that I'll make here about his verbal... <laughs> verbal manipulation is more or less what he's doing. He's taking this incident and he's trying to paint himself as a white knight, which He's saying, I'm not a victim, this isn't about me, which this entire interview is characterized by Alex's apparent view of himself of being a victim. And you'll see that as it plays out, and I'll show you kind of more how that actually is playing out with what he's saying in regards to what he's done in the past and what it actually played out as in the context of what he's speaking. But it's very, very much, he says he doesn't want to be a victim and then says that, you know, he is a victim the entire time. Along with that, he has a difficult time relating any form of genuine relationship to Hutchins. He didn't have a solid relationship with her, and everything that he's talking about here is just centered around the work side of things. They weren't friends on any levels, they were simply 
co-workers who he may have appreciated her work ethic, but they were not friends from what you could see from their actual life patterns and what he's saying here. Just wanted to make note of those things, fascinating things that really do kind of have some, some way in this, and we'll see how later on. Make the film, you know what I mean? In the case of Helena, we sat down collaboratively and talked a lot about what we wanted to do in that uh, a precious amount of time we had. But um, I, I, I want to make sure that I don't come across like I'm the victim because we have two victims here. And the second thing is, is that all of what happened on that day leading up to this event. I'm going to pause it here because he's about to do another really gross thing, but he's still harping back around to that. There's two victims and he's talking about the other people. And now he's already going to start blame shifting from himself to everyone else. We'll see this play out. And this is, this is Alex MO. It's never his fault. It's always somebody else's fault around him, which we've seen as I hope you caught on in the past is what he does in times of confrontation that he also may or may not instigate. So those are character traits that we need to note about Alec and we'll see them pop up here as well. So let's watch. Was precipitated on one idea, and that is that Helena and I had something profound in common. And that is we both assumed the gun was empty. Other than those, you know, uh, dummy rounds. I want to get into more detail. So here he's trying to compare himself to the person who has been killed. He is the same as she is. And, and in, that, in that they just assumed that the gun was empty. Now there's more to this obviously and we'll unpack that as well. And yes, technically that is a that might be a true assumption is that she thought it was empty and maybe he thought it was empty. That's still a question. We'll get there. Maybe he thought it was empty and so they're the same that way. But his reason for doing that is to draw that connection between himself and the victim herself, the one who passed. That you know what? It wasn't necessarily all his fault. It was also maybe kind of Kind of her fault too, because she also thought it was it was empty. So it, also her. It's just I don't know. It's very early on into this interview, and he's already doing some really kind of sleazy things. But have hope. There's more coming. The day in a minute, but let's take a step back. What was it that drew you to this project in the first place? To Rust. I'd worked on a project with Joel before. Joel Susan, Susan, director. right. He, he did this movie, Crown Vic, that I produced. And uh, Joel and I stayed in touch. We're friends, and I loved Rust. He, he said, I want to send you this. And I read it, and I said, I love it. Very excited. Very, very, so excited that we finally got this made. So this entire portion of it is characterized by him shaking his head no, just then I love it, blah, blah, blah. And it's just consistently no. Now, the no's are pretty macro. They're large enough that it could be conscious movements. And that could be on, related to the unbelievableness nature of it. A lot of people will do that when they're talking about something that seems incredible. They'll shake their head because it's unbelievable the no lines up. Now, this is obviously culturally and within the culture that Alec is from that does synchronized. Now, that doesn't mean that he was not or good friends or what have you with the people before. I will find it interesting that he's just good friends with everybody that he's mentioning here, despite, despite some other patterns in his past, which like I said, will play into this a little bit later. So he's good friends with everybody and we'll see how this all plays out. Because every independent film has many false starts, you know what I mean? And when it finally goes, you finally get, you feel like a plane, when you finally get some lift under your wings, it's very, very gratifying. I am a purely creative producer. My authorities as a producer are casting and script, which are actually married to the role of being a lead actor in a film. So you're not the kind of producer who's looking at the line item of each budget? No, 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 no. They're, they're, they're basically, two types of producers who are who are really in charge of production people that raise the money and the people who spend the money my consultations or approvals were completely about casting and about the script I so this is letting us know just a little bit of the role that alec is saying that he played in this so you'll see here that in this story alec is either one a very inept gun handler firearm user and it caused the worst accident that can happen to happen because of his ineptitude or alternatively he did something very cruel and so that's kind of what we're going on off off of this and so we're seeing here that this is laying some of that foundation for us to understand that at very very best Alec wasn't involved in in hiring or deciding on any of the movements of the film he just wanted to kind of work with the cast which he says is 
what some producers are and some producers aren't fair, but it is something that we want to know about how he handles it specifically, this detached air. Let's continue. I don't hire anybody in the crew. I don't Not even me. the cinematographer, no one. No, no, but what we, he will apprise me of what he's doing. And he'll say to me, I got Helena Hutchins to be the DP. I said, oh, how do you feel about that? Are you excited? I'm very excited. She's wonderful. What did you know about Helena Hutchins before she started working on this? I knew nothing about her until Joel said to me, I got her. She was fantastic. The people who watch the daily. Okay, so something that I'll note about the, the flow of his words here that will pop up more prevalently later on is that when he starts feeling agitation, he speeds up and he stutters a lot more. And you'll hear it really come to fruition later on in this interview around some very specific points. Now where it's important is because it comes up in some other points that help us have some clarity to the earlier ones in this interview. And you'll see how this all ties together and, and how this process if you go through the entire extent of it, which once again, this is a YouTube video. This isn't the full, this isn't an investigation. This is a no way a legal anything. We're watching YouTube. But if you go through the entire extent of this and you start picking everything apart, detail by detail, along with cross-referencing and also having character checklists throughout the background and back history of the person, you could start to really understand what they do non-verbally later on and what it means. So this is kind of what we're gonna be able to see is all of this mass of detail come together so that we can understand Alec in this situation. Let's continue. They said that her work was beautiful. She was someone who was loved by everyone who worked with and liked by everyone who worked with and admired. Okay, so we know that he doesn't know Hutchins too well, even by his own phrasing of things. They were not close friends. And so that makes this instance interesting. It's interesting at its very surface level. Either one, it's very heartwarming because a man is showing just intense emotion about losing somebody that he cared for and worked with. That would be, that would be the positive side of this. Either that or alternatively, and kind of indicated possibly by his nonverbal communication, is that he's forcing out some tears here to be able to really hammer home his part, AKA manipulate you. Now, the only reason that I think it might be that is because of how quickly, once again, it sets onto his face. Within about like a half to a quarter of a second, he goes from fine to very tearful and there's no onset. Now, I've spoken about this in the past on the channel. Emotions have a profile on which they normally will flow, and this isn't always the case. There are always exceptions, especially in something like psychology or nonverbal communication where we're dealing with the mind and that's so, so difficult to understand still. So there is the possibility that yes, he just crashed hard into this tearful emotion but that is not how it statistically flows with a, an emotional profile, so it is a red flag. Could be fake, just need to keep track of it in context with everything else. Let's continue forward. I'm sorry. But admired by everybody who, um, so this does seem to be fairly genuine. It is synchronized across the bottom and top halves of his face. He is sniffling from what you can hear. It sounds like it's a genuine sniffle. It's not just a dry fake one. And it's difficult to see because of the resolution of the video, but it does seem as though his eyes are inflamed. Now, this is all pushing me to believe that it would be a genuine emotion, except for that early, early onset. So with that early, early onset, but now with the genuine display, if I did not know who Alec was, my question would be, has he been trained in the performing arts to be able to display genuinely while not being genuine? And sure enough, he has. So it still is not counteracting his earlier possibly fake onset. We just have to keep that in mind as we continue forward. Who worked with her? The day that I flew there, they'd been shooting for a week already. I come the following week on the 11th, that night of the 11th, I had dinner with Helena and Joel and we talked about some of the compositions I was thinking of to... Uh, that was the first time you met? First time I met Helena, yeah. What was your first impression? When I met her, I knew she had that spark. 
I knew she had that flint to her, that she was going to get that day's work done and get the shots that she wanted. She was very focused. She had a vision for she the film? She was very focused. We had a discussion about compositions of shots. So he does use that. He, she was very focused rep repetition as well. So maybe that is something that's in his verbal patterning is that he uses that repetition. Could be because he's an actor or on-screen talent that that's something that he just does. There is that possibility. I am keeping keeping mind of it. But if I remember correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong in the comments below because this one I forgot to take notes on specifically, if I remember correctly, this film, the entire thing was set to be shot in it within 21 days. So a number of the days have already passed of this shoot, and now he's finally meeting Hutchins for the first time, and he's trying to pull out this thing that they were like, you know, pretty, pretty good friends, or becoming new friends, or they were even at any level friends at the point of this this incident. I don't know, I'm not sure. I would say that that's a pretty short amount of time, but you can make a friend in that short of amount of time. It just is a, a question of the depth of that relationship. If that does make sense, just helping us add some context to all of the personal dynamics between this, this, everything. Lots of what you were shooting, these beautiful tableaus of the West. She had that intensity. Every day you went to work, she would say, good morning, how are you? How was your evening? Boom, it was small talk, go. We weren't gonna hang out and, and chit chat or whatever. She knew that the clock was the enemy and we have to move forward. On the 12th, I had a safety demonstration with Hannah Reed, the arm. So notice all of the recollection of her, her personality, what, what he felt of her was strictly centered around business. They're not friends, they're coworkers. That's fine. Being on set and you're with your coworkers as well. You don't have to be friends. You can be coworkers. So, but the fact that he's trying to pull in that they were friends and all this is just showing us that it was it was more manipulation at that point to try to draw this relationship that he really didn't have. They 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 were just coworkers. Let's be quite clear about that. Now we're going to go ahead and get to uh, closer to the incident itself. We spent an hour and a half shooting the pistol. Her giving me all her safety instructions. Did you think she was up to the job? I assumed because she was there and she was hired, she was she was up for the job. And nothing. Okay, I want to pause this here and talk about who they're talking about. I won't mention names because it's not about slandering anybody. So this young woman who was hired, it was a very new experience for her. She had only done one one shoot before as a lead armor, the person in charge of the weaponry for the film. So it was her second one and that that is fine, but it is stressful. Along with that, since this was a small budget film, she was overly stretched with her work responsibilities, which makes it more difficult as well. So these are two decisions that have been made by Alex hiring team and we know that he's he's distanced himself from any of the detail work He just has the creative vision and spends the money So he doesn't really know any of this stuff But he's really kind of just told his team to cut the corners that they can to save as much money as they can For an indie film and so we might have a, a fairly green and thinly stretched armorer trying to do the jobs of more than one person which is common in indie films, but Definitely, definitely not excusable. So I just want to make note of that as we continue forward. That's who he's referring to here as he was working with the weapon. I think she did raise any red flags with you. No. Okay. This, this training course you do, what did she tell you? She said things like, remember, this is, a, this is a blank round. So you have to create the discharge yourself because there's no projectile. So if you shot the gun, you go bang. When you roll the camera, you got to go bang and have the gun, gun snap back. You have to create that. She would give you little tips about firing. And she'd say to you, you know, when we're done, point the gun down. When we're done, you give the gun to me or to Halls, only those two people. Sometimes we would be on a set. So the other person mentioned there was the other producer. He plays an interesting part in this in that he, he said that he was the one who checked the gun. And in the film community, there's a lot of debate around many of the workings of this set specifically. There was a lot of stuff that was cut corner-wise in regards to this and some malpractices that definitely led to the situation that we see here. And Alec, being a producer, is directly responsible for many of those decisions that were made, though he has already tried to shift the blame away and separate himself from it. Fascinating things to note. Let's continue. 
that was a very, very cramped set, and they wanted people in that room on an as-needed basis. If I'm holding the gun and they say cut, I then hand the gun to Halls if she's not there. Yeah, why Halls, not Hannah? Some people have said that only the armorer should be handling. No, 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 no. That, that's that's in, inaccurate. Meaning, in, in 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 the protocols of the business, meaning Hannah would to hand me the gun ninety nine percent. I'm sorry, it's almost comical. So this is where his flusteredness is really coming into fruition. As I mentioned earlier, no, no, no. He's almost vomiting shenanigans like there's nothing making sense in this and the reason for that is because he's backpedaling he's been confronted on something and then something that he's been confronted on by many professionals in the field as well and he's backpedaling and throwing out excuses for himself it's really not acceptable excuses because somebody is is gone from this world forever because of his decisions but he is trying to do that so that is a red flag for us there there's something highly, highly agitating centered around that specific thing about maybe, maybe there was a little bit of malpractice on his set. Hmm. ...of the time, no, whatever, the, the preponderance of the time. But when we would say cut, if Hannah was away from the set, I would hand Halls the gun. One of the things her attorney has said is that she was hired for two positions on the film and therefore was stretched in an inappropriate way. Did she raise any of those concerns with you? No, I assume that everyone who's shooting a lower budget film uh, is stretched, myself included. Okay, so I will go ahead and add some more context for you. There were other complaints from other crew members about the conditions of the set. Apparently it was not good, it was not safe, it was not humane in some areas, and it was just overall bad. So his excuse is that it's an indie film. Everybody has to work harder. There are budgetary cuts that you have to work with and this can all be true. But I can absolutely promise you that in light of that, filmmakers who care about the people that they're working with, they prioritize safety, period. If you're gonna cut the budget, cut it in other areas, never in areas that would at any level put somebody at risk. So that's where a lot of filmmakers are like, uh -uh -mm, I'm sorry. That's not an excuse. So then there's also this concept of, of, of a set that is not functioning well and Alec is trying to play off that he has no idea that it's not functioning that well. He thinks it's a well-oiled machine, as he said in a later clip. <sighs> Which obviously wasn't true. There were multiple accidents that did happen that might come up here later on with some other misfires from other weapons. There were, there was even an alleged accident where another person had accidentally shot themselves in the foot with a prop weapon. I was not able to track down the sources for that, so keep that one in mind as you will. Regardless, there were definite and verifiable other misfires on the set, and the team is stretched thin, as many have reported, but Alec has no idea, and the question is, why would Alec have no idea? If he's genuinely innocent, like he's claiming he is, why is nobody telling him that? And I think it has something to do with his long laundry list of self-entitlement and being an asshole. But I'm not dead positive about that, so I'd like to continue on through this, this interview so that you could really see how this all fleshes out. And I, I, I got no complaints from her or the prop department. I'm not sitting there when I'm getting dressed and ready to go to a scene and say, oh my God, the prop woman seemed very harried today. I didn't get a sense of that from, from, from any of the, the, the people on the film. The first... Now, I heard this the first time, and every time that I hear this, I hear it two different ways. Either one, I think the way that he was intending it was, he's not looking around and he doesn't see people that are looking stressed. I think that's what he was trying to say, but that's not what he said. He said he just wasn't looking around to see if anybody was being stressed. And so he's like, I'm not looking around to see, oh, such and such hairstylist or such and such person is feeling bad today. I'm not doing that. Now that's literally what he said. While he might have meant that he didn't see anybody, it, he said that he didn't look for anybody, which actually does fit in a lot more with his MO than him just not seeing anybody being stressed. He doesn't care about other people, so it makes more sense that he might not have picked up on or been approached with some of the problems. That is a little bit biased, I will say that. However, it does fit in with his character sketch from earlier on and just the patterns that we've seen him 
develop throughout decades of his life. So that's what that's based off of. Let's continue forward. First time I heard that there was any problem with anybody uh, in the crew of the film was when Luber said, well, we have some issues here. When he quit, now, the day before that happened, we wrapped. And he came up to me and he said, thank you for the position you've taken on behalf of IATSE and the union on social media. So this is an interesting dynamic as well. So this, this person works through the entire film and then at rap says that he quits and he goes and he approaches Alec and says, thanks for this and then leaves and then this is the letter. So we have to ask why is that the approach that was taken? I don't know anything about the gentleman who quit. I did not do any research into his character. I don't know if he might have difficulty with confrontation and decided to do a letter or something along those lines. I do know Alec's behavior from his past and how badly he reacts to people who confront him or tell him that he's wrong or show him that they think differently than him in any way. It even comes up in this interview later on, you'll see. So I know that he does react angrily and he can be physically violent with his anger. So if you think about that as him being a producer, a self-entitled producer who has a history of lashing out irrationally and angrily and physically to people around him that bother him, would you go and approach him with problems? I, I probably wouldn't, especially if I needed a job, I would probably try to buckle down and work that job and then get out and let everybody know. Just fascinating, but once again, that's what I would do. I do not know that that's the situation. He could have just been afraid of conflict and it's very possible. But like I said, we know Alec. I said, my pleasure. He said, because we have some issues here. I said, such as, and he said, my men need a better hotel room. There was no mention of safety issues. He didn't say anything about the accidental he discharges on set. He didn't say anything about anything. Other. He goes, my men need better hotel rooms. Okay, so that's the start here. That makes me have a question. If there have been accidental misfirings on set and that didn't weigh as high as the living conditions for the, the workers, I just have to ask. And especially, this is where I'm a little bit more outraged. In indie filmmaking, so many sacrifices from the people involved are made. It's really true that it has to be something made out of passion. You have to do that. So, especially in things like living, you'll oftentimes be like, yeah, I slept on the ground or I slept on the floor of a small apartment or I slept on the floor of a hotel. It's, it's pretty ragtag scattered about. So that understanding and all of these people having been involved in shoots before coming to this one and them understanding that as well, it's not likely that they were stuck in some very quality living situation and decided they wanted a better hotel. That's not how crews function. The likelihood is, is that it was not a great living situation for them to be staying in. And also judging by the rest of how everything else was handled in the filming of Rust, it would make more sense that it was very terrible, so bad so that it even warranted being addressed over accidental misfirings of weapons on set. Wow, very, very interesting. Let's continue forward. I said, well, we're leaving, we're wrapping. Will you be here tomorrow? He said, yes. Mm, this is interesting. I, I know I just paused this. He's about to do something that's just classic like, Lowest level effort of lying ever. Just, <laughs> just ever. And, and I don't know that he's lying, but you'll see what I mean. Because what I was about to do, which I've done on any number of films and TV projects, was to give more of the, my salary back to the production to pay for X. <laughs> Isn't he just a white knight? What he was about to do was just give a lot of his money away, like he does, like he was, he was definitely about to do that. He didn't have the chance, unfortunately, but you know, he was, he was definitely just right on the brink of doing that, as he's let us know here, because he's the white knight, he's the good guy. I don't know, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not an expert on Alec Baldwin, I have some understanding of him, but I, I definitely doubt that he, really tried at any level to get that money or that compensation to that crew on any, any form. I don't have any, any actual proof for that. I just, my spidey senses are tingling, I guess, so. 
and I was about to say to him, let me know what it would be to be and be you guys in a house that's closer to the, how we can address your problem. I will be happy to contribute to, to that. The next day they were gone. So you had no sense from anyone on the set that people had been stretched to the point where safety was compromised? No, no. I never heard one word about that, none, none. That's a lot of insistence around that. I would definitely ask some questions here, especially in context with everything else. That no, no, never heard a single word of it, none, nothing. Couldn't even, couldn't conceive of it. It's so foreign of an idea that I could not wrap my brain around the idea that something was going poorly on my poorly budgeted and run set. Just couldn't, what, wow, like, come on, Alec. Really? Really? Well, maybe though. So far we have seen that he has difficulty seeing past the end of his own nose, but I'm not sure. When people say cutting costs, I don't say this with any judgment or any cynicism. Spielberg wants to save money. Tom Cruise wants to save money. Everybody who makes movies has a responsibility not to be reckless and careless with the money that you're given. We know that those are men who make movies that cost $205 million. And I'm making movies that cost $5 million or The question, pounds. though, is were costs being cut at the expense of safety and security? Well, in, 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 my, in my opinion, no, because I did not... Now, I did not... <laughs> See? See, this is what I mean. Okay, so... Were costs being cut at the expense of safety? There have been multiple weapons misfired. Somebody was killed on set. Crew was understaffed, not taken care of. And he, <laughs> no, no, I, 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 I do not even know. I've had no, 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 no. You see here, and he goes through his an entire spiel of agitation, which we've seen pop up before and pop up before, and we'll continue to see pop up again and again. Very interesting that he's so agitated around this subject of possible safety being ignored, I think would be a good word for it, for the sake of saving money. And he tries to once again play it off onto the indie filmmaker community by saying there's budget cuts everywhere. That doesn't matter, Baldwin. Somebody is dead. I don't care how much money you saved, you saved money and it caused her to die because of your ineptitude at very best. No, I don't blame this on the filmmaking, don't blame this on the budget, blame this on your own inability to run your set. You're the producer. Let's continue. Not observe any safety or security issues at all in the time I was there. Everybody there was so he also said, I will make note of this because this is a, this was likely a legally coached thing. I did not observe any safety issues. That's not the question. The question was, did you know about any safety issues? Did you hear about them? Did you know about them? He says, I did not see a single one. Okay. Having a positive experience. People who are watching the show, people who back home, you have no idea how unique an environment a motion picture set is. It's kind of, there's an instant familiar. Those of you who are filmmakers out there, I included, do you genuinely have no idea how unique an environment it is? Only, only Alec knows. Only the Baldwin has the wisdom. The amount of care, these are people who are professionals who have really good jobs in a field they love. And I looked at all these people and, and I see how hard they work. They're so hardworking and they're so conscientious and you're around people. I just want to pause it real quick. Alec is going to go and get super, super emotional about the industry that he just kind of threw under the bus for that's why somebody might be dead is because every indie film cuts corners with stuff. And so now he's going to try to get really emotional about it. And I'll talk about it at the end of this. We'll watch. And you're part of one of the great collaborative processes in the world, movie making. Everyone moving like a watch to get everything done. And you know, when you kind of, mar I, I don't make that many movies anymore. Because movie making demanded that I travel. And I didn't want to leave my family. All these movies I made, I stayed home. I didn't want to go, if I went away, I went away for a week. To leave my family for four weeks and go shoot this movie, shoot this movie, that was a big deal. And I'm sitting on this, this pew. And so help me God, 
I sat on that pew right before they called lunch, and I said, this movie has made me love making movies again. Because I used to love to make movies. I did. You know, I worked with people once. I was going to do the movie The Edge, and uh, they called me and said they got Tony Hopkins to do the film. What do you make of it? Yeah, look if we're here. And I started sobbing. I just started sobbing because I thought, oh, God, I'm going to have a chance to work with this guy. Any chance you can go easy on me? When they cast me in It's Complicated with Meryl, I thought, I'm going to get to go make a movie with her. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> sorry. You know, people, they have their dreams. No matter how old you are, you have your dreams of people you want to work with. And this movie made me love making movies again. I really thought we were onto something that day. Okay, so we just finished that whole spiel of emotional talking about how sorry Alec feels for himself and how bad it is that he, he was just starting to love making movies again. And so what Alec has done throughout this interview, and if you've paid attention, you might have caught on to this, is that he continually mentions his own name alongside these other celebrities, as if he's trying to really group himself in with these great names. And this isn't really at all important to the question, important to the incident, important to anything. It's just letting us know Alex's ego. He does see himself as one of the best things to touch the ground. There are also some interesting things about the family dynamics that he's mentioning, especially in regards to leaving his family, trying to paint himself as this very upstanding human being in regards to his children, and there's more on that a little bit later. And what's fascinating to me is that this does seem to be very genuine emotion. He's showing genuine emotion here. He's having difficulty speaking in ways that are seemingly synchronized. So yes, he could still be acting here, but if you remember, the onset of this happened like an emotional onset that had to build up to the actual emotion itself, and it would have a fall off that cut right afterwards, but it would have a fall off as well. But with that natural build up and the synchronization throughout it, we know that this is genuine emotion. Now what's frustrating to me is that he's showing genuine emotion when he's having a pity party about his film history, and he's not showing any genuine emotion when talking about the woman that he, at very best, unintentionally murdered. I don't know. I don't know. Let's continue watching. I did exactly what I've done every day on that movie. Set the scene right before that happened. You're sitting in a pew in the church. Right. What's the scene supposed to be? The scene is the two, two guys are there who have got me, uh, uh, you know, cornered, and they think I'm shot pretty bad, and I'm kind of wilting, and they, are, they have a gun, and then the sound outside distracts them. And I would draw the gun, out, cross draw out of my holster, pull the gun up like that, and start to cock the pistol cut. I'm handed a gun, and someone declares, they said, this is a cold gun. So I want to make note, he's being very specific with what he's mentioning, and that's actually fair, especially in making a video. So much of what goes into making a film, a real film, is <laughs> way more calculated than many people would expect, even down to those smaller movements of making sure that you want the framing of the hand to be in the right area on the third. And, there's a lot. So the likelihood is, is that he's being genuine about this recollection of where he was grabbing in the scene. And along with that, he's using spatial gestures as well, just kind of adding some more relevance to what he's saying. I would believe that this is how the scene was set up to go. Now he's talking about the weapon that was handed to him being a cold weapon. Let's watch. Dave Halls. Well, the, 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 the first AD. In my years on the sets of film, hot gun meant that there was a charge in there and cold gun meant there was nothing in there. When he's saying this, this is a cold gun, what he's saying to everybody on the set is you can relax. So that's true. The hot gun means that there's a charge. A cold gun means that it, would, it wouldn't, it doesn't have a charge. It's just more or less it. So with the first AD, the first assistant director, Dave, him saying this is a cold gun, that would be a fault on his part. That's fault maybe one in this, it could have been earlier on with the armorer as well, or something even before that. So this is at least the first, perhaps one of many prior faults as well that led up to this incident of if 
Alec is being correct on this, the first AD, saying a gun was clear when it wasn't. Interesting. The gun is empty. That's what cold gun means. Well, cold gun means there's no charge in there. There could be dummy rounds. And you were rehearsing that scene. Was it an actual rehearsal? There's some disagreement about that, whether it was a formal rehearsal at that time. This is a marking rehearsal, where I'm going to show her. She's standing next to the camera. She's like this. You're me. She's got a monitor here. The camera is here filming that way. She so some notes that I'll make about this setup that they're talking about here. Once again, it's interesting because they didn't have the proper safety protocols in place, especially even in regards to their camera while shooting outdoors and a gunfight scene. They didn't have any form of barrier between the scene and the camera, which is fascinating. Maybe it was a set thing, but it was likely a budget thing, just judging by the rest of everything else that has been centered around money for Alec. So it, if it were, and that was the reason, this is yet another step that was not taken in regards to being safe on set. Cut corners on the costumes, don't cut corners on the safety. Cut corners elsewhere, not on the safety. Just take care of the safety. It's arguably the most important one because if you don't, then here we are. So he's describing a setup that sounds like it might not be the safest setup at very best, but let's continue on through it and we'll talk a little bit more. Takes a monitor that, his, that is his monitor, the operator, and turns it toward her. It swivels and she says to me, hold the gun lower. Go to your right. Okay, right there. All right, do that. Now show it a little bit lower. And she's getting me to position the gun. Everything is in her direction. She's guiding me through how she wants me to hold the gun for this angle. And I, I draw the gun out and I find a mark. I draw the gun out and I find a cut. And what's really urgent is the gun wasn't meant to be fired in that angle. So if you're shooting directly into the camera lens, you're not aiming I'm not at her. shooting into the camera lens. I'm shooting just off. Just off. Right, in her direction. I'm holding the gun where she told me to hold it, which ended up being aimed right in below her armpit. Okay, so let's just go ahead and pause it here. So Alec is trying to describe the instance leading up to the incident, and it's revealing as to his processing and his argument behind this is that she was directing him how he should behave on camera to look best. Very normal. In this directing, he's saying that she either willingly or unwillingly told him to point a gun at her. A gun which had been declared and claimed as a cold gun. Now, a few things about this on Alec's part. One, if you're handling a gun, make sure that you check it to make sure that it's okay. He claims that he was told not to do that earlier on, so he never has ever, 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 which I don't, I don't, I, okay. Sure. The other thing is that he pointed a gun willingly at another person, which is just gun 101, don't do. Just don't ever do. And his response was is that she was telling him to do that. And that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if somebody asks you to point a gun at them, you probably should not point said gun at them, just kind of as a rule of thumb, regardless of how, like, ploringly they do ask. Just start with assuming you're not gonna. So he's already done two malpractice things with his gunfighting, which we remember from that earlier interview that they're just always at his fingertips as he's a master of all of his horseback riding and what motorcycle riding, French and gunfighting or something like that are just, he's, he's old school and he knows it. You know, he knows it just not very well or if he does know it, it's in a, a malpractice form of it. So that's really good. So, so far we have two different things of what Alec has done here that are bad gun etiquette 101. So far, two. There was one from somebody else handing him a falsely prepped gun, and then there's some from him as well. Let's continue. It was what I was told, I don't know. This was a completely incidental shot, an angle that may not have ended up in the film at all. But we kept doing this, so then I said to her, now in this scene, I'm gonna cock the gun. I said, do you want to see that? And she said, yes. So I take the gun and I start to cock the gun. I'm not going to pull the trigger. I, I said, do you see that? She goes, well, just cheat it down and tilt it down a little bit like that. And I cock the gun. I go, can you see that? Can you see that? Can you see that? And she says, and then I let go of the hammer of the gun and the gun goes off. Okay. So I don't remember the exact model of Colt 45 that he was using in this Western film. However, gun experts have weighed in on this and said that this is not possible unless the gun was tampered with, which was also not likely. We'll talk about the possibility of that a little bit later, but 
On top of that, yet another thing that Alec has done in Bad Gun Etiquette 101 is you don't pull the hammer of a gun back and then just release it. You, you, you don't, because it can misfire. It can misfire from just doing that alone. A lot of the times it is due to a malfunction, but some of the older Western revolvers especially, they could fire from just the contact of the hammer. So him releasing that lets us know that he doesn't understand gun etiquette. And what's curious to me is that in this narrative, he's a very experienced actor who has worked with so many guns in the past that he knows them in and out for film, and he still didn't know a basic thing like that in regards to gun safety. So it's just fascinating to me that in this, this narrative that Alec is portraying that he's so dumb. It's just fascinating to me that that's his fallback is that he's not competent. Fascinating. <laughs> I let go of the hammer of the gun, the gun goes off. At the moment. The decisive that was the moment. moment the gun went off, yeah. That was the moment the gun went off. It wasn't in the script for the trigger to be pulled. Well, the trigger wasn't pulled. I didn't pull the trigger. So no. you never pulled the trigger? No, no, no. I, I would never point a gun at anyone and pull a trigger at them, never. never. That was the training that I had. You don't point a gun at me and, and pull the trigger. On day one of my instruction in this business, people said to me, never take a gun and go click, 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 because even though it's incremental, you damage the firing pin on the gun if you do that. Don't do that. So you have this cold 45, you just pulled... The hammer as far back as I could without cocking the actual And gun. you're holding onto the hammer. I'm holding that. I'm, I'm just showing I go, how about that? Does that work? Do you see that? Do you see that? Do you see that? She goes, yeah, that's good. I let go of the hammer. Bang, the gun goes off. Well, everyone is horrified. They're shocked. Uh, it's loud. They don't have their earplugs in. No one was The gun was supposed to be empty. I was told I was handed an empty gun. If there were cosmetic rounds, nothing with a charge at all, a flash round, nothing. She goes down. I thought to myself, did she faint? The notion that there was a live round in that gun did not dawn on me till probably 45 minutes to an hour later. 45 minutes to an hour? Like I said, in this narrative, the narrative pointed out by Alec, he's just, like, he's really simple. He's a very simple-minded human. There was a loud bang when he released the hammer of, of a weapon. That's a genuine weapon. Prop guns, just there are different versions of prop guns. Oftentimes when you want to replicate the weight and movement of a genuine weapon, you use a genuine weapon with blank rounds. So these are genuine weapons that can shoot live bullets. And he releases a hammer on one of these. A, a loud bang goes off and somebody in front of him where the gun was pointed falls to the ground not moving, and it's not until 45 minutes to an hour later that he's like, wait a second, was she shot? Is that what that was? Was that, is, Alec. Is that what we're buying? Is that it was 45 minutes to an hour later before you got that? I, I don't know, highly doubt it. I don't know, Alec, I don't think you're as innocent as you say you are. She's laying there and I go, did she get hit by wadding? Was there a blank, sometimes those blank rounds have a wadding inside that packs, it's like, like a cloth that packs the gunpowder in. Sometimes wadding comes out and can hit people and it can feel like a little bit of a poke. But no one could understand, did she have a heart attack? Because remember, the idea that someone put a live bullet in the gun was not even in reality. Did you go up to her or did you back away? I went away? up to her and then we were immediately we were told to get out of the building. We were forced to get out of the building. The medics came in. I mean, I stood over her for 60 seconds and she just lay there kind of in shock. Was she conscious? Uh, my recollection is yes. When she went down, he went down and he was screaming really loudly and I thought, what is he screaming? What happened? Within 15 minutes or 20 minutes after that, the police arrived and took the church set and put the crime tape around it, the yellow tape, and forced us all to the perimeters of the parking area where we sat and waited. She I just, just keep in mind, this is all happening, and I, I believe this is within the 45 minutes to an hour that Alec mentioned that he just, in his story, could not fathom that a gunshot had gone off from the gun he had shot. Mm, wow, it's just wow. And he's made it to adulthood at this level of intellect in his story. I, it's, it's a question for me. She was in the church and she was not taken out of the church for quite a while. But nobody told you what happened? No, no. It, it, it wasn't until I was in the police station. 
Hours later, I mean, it was like seeing aliens. It was, it was utter disbelief over the idea. It was unacceptable, the idea that it was a live round. And finally, one of the police officers at the conclusion of my interview, I was there for like an hour and a half or so, she takes her phone and she slides it across to me. She says, that's what came out of Joel's shoulder. A 45 caliber slug it was a real bullet. Had you known that Joel had been hit? No one had any idea until that police officer, that sheriff's officer said to me, this is the slug, 45 caliber slug they took out of Joel's arm. And then the kind of in- I'm not sure about that portion of it. I wasn't able to capture any footage around that. And I do find it interesting that nobody had any idea until she showed that picture that Joel had been hit, but he also recollected that Joel was screaming. So I, I highly doubt that any, nobody had any idea and that there was a fully grown screaming man and one woman had fallen to the ground after a gunshot. I don't know, just, just thinking outside the box on that one. This one's not, not scientific at all. This is just, I don't know. You tell me, would you disagree? But then he also has some weird discrepancy with the times because he's saying he didn't even, it didn't even dawn on him about it being the possibility of a round until an hour later. And then they had no idea that it was a live round until two to three hours later after his interview and all this stuff had happened. Maybe, maybe that's the case. Once again, we're really having to assume a lot of ignorance on Alex's part to be able to get to this point. Maybe he has that capacity, I'm not sure, but it doesn't, I don't, I don't think Alec is that dumb. I don't think so. Insanity inducing agony of thinking that someone put a live bullet in the gun. We, we've all seen that picture of you off the set in that hour or so after. We'll talk a little bit about this live bullet instance here in a bit, because that is genuinely a very important detail. How did a live round get into a into a, a prop gun? We're not sure, and all that I have in regards to that would be some guessing, <laughs> just coming up with ideas, more or less, just surmising, assuming maybe, all of those really, really reliable forms of data sharing, but I'll let you know that I'm assuming on those portions. We'll talk about that in a little bit. For now, let's continue on on this. After the gun went off. What were you doing? What was going through your mind? At the end of, she was laying there and she was there for a while. I was, I was amazed at how long they didn't get her in a car and get her out, but they waited and a helicopter came. And by the time the helicopter took off with her and I mean, literally lifted off, we were all glued to that process outside. When she finally left, I, I, I don't know how long it was. She was there, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. It, was, it seemed like a very long time. But they kept saying, well, she's stable. Like, like nobody, just as you disbelieved that there was a live round in the gun, you disbelieved that this was gonna be a fatal accident. So you didn't know exactly how serious it was. At the very end of my interview with the sheriff's department, they said to me, we regret to tell you that she didn't make it, she died. They told me right then and there. And that's when I went in the parking lot and called my wife to talk to my wife. When this happened, real quick, some people have asked me to analyze this, this, this picture of him in, in the parking lot. And I don't do photograph analysis because they don't work really. You can get some very basic, basic, basic general information from a photograph, but nonverbal communication is definitely a, a it's movement based. So to try to analyze everything off of one frame just won't work. So that won't work for those of you who have asked. I won't do that. It's just kind of spreading about misinformation on that front. So now let's go ahead and, and start looking about some of these, these details around what well, the actual incident here. Her husband comes to town. Her husband, Matthew. And I met with him and their son. And he was as kind as you could be. What can you possibly say to him? The, 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 I didn't know what to say. He, he hugged me and he goes, he goes, I, I suppose you and I are gonna go through this together, he said. And I thought, well, not as much as you are, you know, and his little boy is there who's nine years old. I have, I have six kids now. I have my older daughter, Ireland, but of the six kids that Ilaria and I have, my oldest is eight. I have a nine month old baby. 
And I think to myself, this little boy um, doesn't have a mother anymore. And I know that in my life, I'm with my kids and I'm doing quite well with my kids. My kids and I are having a great time right until my wife walks in the room and then I become invisible. My kids all go and they uh, uh, jump on top of their mother. And this boy doesn't have a mother anymore. And, um, and there's nothing we can do to bring her back. Okay, so I'm going to let you know some of what Alec has done here. And real quick before I do that, let's talk about what he just said there in regards to his children, the relationship he has with his children. Now, if you remember at the beginning of this video, I let you know about a certain voicemail that he left for his daughter, Ireland, who he really quickly breezes right by. I have Ireland and then also these other one. And he does that for a reason because he knows. He knows that he's not a great dad. Here's this voicemail. I will go ahead and just play it here. And, and it's a couple minutes long and it's pretty, pretty disgusting. Remember, she is 11 years old at this time and he is calling her during a, a custody battle for her. Let's go ahead and roll that. Hey, I want to tell you something, okay? And I want to leave a message for you right now, because again, it's 10.30 here in New York on a Wednesday. And once again, I've made an ass of myself trying to get to a phone to call you at a specific time. When the time comes for me to make the phone call, I stop whatever I'm doing, and I go and I make that phone call at 11 o'clock in the morning in New York, and if you don't pick up the phone at 10 o'clock at night, and you don't even have that goddamn phone turned on, I want you to know something, okay? I, I, I'm tired of playing this game with you. I'm leaving this message with you to tell you, you have insulted me for the last time. You have insulted me. You don't have the brains or the decency as a human being. I don't give a damn that you're 12 years old or 11 years old or that you're a child or that your mother is a thoughtless pain in the ass who doesn't care about what you do as far as I'm concerned. You have humiliated me for the last time with this phone. And when I come out there next week, I'm going to fly out there for the day just to straight you out on this issue. I'm going to let you know just how disappointed in you I am and how angry I am with you that you've done this to me again. You've made me feel like shit and you've made me feel like a fool over and over and over again. And this crap you pull on me with this goddamn phone situation that you would never dream of doing to your mother and you do it to me constantly and over and over again. I am going to get on a plane, and I'm going to come out there for the day, and I'm going to straighten your ass out when I see you. Do you understand me? I'm going to really make sure you get it. Then I'm going to get on a plane, and I'm going to turn around, and I'm going to come home. So you better be ready Friday the 20th to meet with me. So I'm going to let you know just how I feel about what a rude little pig you really are. You are a rude, thoughtless little pig, okay? So that's how Alec behaves towards a child when a child doesn't do what Alec wants. And so he's trying to paint this picture of him being such like a caring fatherly figure when he, he's not. Maybe, maybe he's changed. That true. Maybe, maybe he's not that terrible human anymore. I mean, there's no other evidence in his life that he's grown that way, but perhaps in this way, specifically towards the people he's closest with, he's just suddenly a much better human being. Doubt it, but maybe that, that could be the, the case. But what he's doing for himself, emotionally for himself, is he's doing a technique used by some actors and actresses, on-screen talent, or anybody who's portraying an emotion that they don't feel at the time but need to portray, is they set an emotional scene for themselves to be able to work into said emotion. So he's talking about his relationship with his kids and the wife and how happy he is and how tragic it would be if that happened so that he can relate to it. And then he can get sad and he can cry and it works that way. We know it works that way because the words definitely come first and then the emotion comes after, especially in context with the forced emotion that he displayed at the beginning of the interview. So with these two kind of working hand in hand, we see that we have an instance of a manipulating 
Alec Baldwin, trying to show us that he cares, and he doesn't. He doesn't care, or at least not to the extent that he's trying to portray. Let's continue. And I told him, I said, I, 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 I don't know what to say. I don't know how to convey to you how sorry I am and how I'm willing to do anything I can to cooperate. People said to me, I mean, I, I got countless people online saying, you, you. So you can see there that weird editing. He's trying to show an emotion, then it like cuts to this weird angle and he's not showing that emotion. So like, that's where I'm wondering how many of these ones where it's just a direct reaction are genuine. So in that area, nothing. I'm not gonna relate anything to that because I do not know if that is contextually in place there. Everywhere else we've kind of seen and we have some context, but especially in that area, mm -mm, not gonna happen. So moving on from this point on, let's let's just keep that little segment out of there because it's, it's not useful. You idiot, you never point a gun at someone. Well, unless you're told it's empty, and it's the director of photography who's instructing you on, on the angle for a- I'm sorry, Alec, that's still not true. Even if a director of photography says, point a gun at me, you say, no, I will not point a gun at you if you haven't checked it. If you've checked it and you know it's empty and they know it's empty and everybody knows it's empty because you all have seen the inside of the weapon as proper firearm safety would say, then perhaps. Rule of thumb is just tell her, you know what, I don't feel comfortable pointing a weapon directly at you, especially one that I haven't checked. So could I point it off to the side or could you move? There you go. There's your solution, Alec, just communicate. But we're gonna see something important about Alec's character here real quick. A shot we're gonna do. And she and I had this thing in common where we both thought it was empty and it wasn't. And that's not her responsibility. That's not my responsibility. Whose responsibility is remains to be seen. But I do, there but are I, some who say you're never supposed to point a gun at anyone on a set, no matter what. Unless the person is the cinematographer who's directing me where to point the gun for her camera angle. There's Alec. There's our boy. So his pitch drops dramatically. Now, when a pitch drops, it means a lack of sincerity, perhaps, a lack of confidence, perhaps. It could be a somberness, like sadness, but one that it can also indicate is rage. And in this one, with the enunciation, the force behind the words, the lowering of the brow, the, the accenting head nods, and that dropped pitch, that's a warning. It's a warning verbally and non-verbally to that interviewer that he's stepping on ground that Alec doesn't like, AKA he's confronting Alec. No, but even though you say this, everybody else says don't do that. So what's your response? Alec gets mad. And this fits in line with Alec. He, he definitely is the type of person to get angry with people who tell him that he's wrong or not the best thing to ever touch down on the face of the planet. And I feel like that's probably not just isolated to his family life, photographers, or this interview. It probably also plays out on the sets that he produces as well, especially maybe ones where it might be a tight budget, understaffed, undercrewed, undercared, so on and so forth. I'm not sure, but perhaps Alec doesn't present a very safe and or functional work environment. And that's why he was unaware this whole time of all of the bad things about it, AKA, Alec, you're a dick, and that's kind of the reason that somebody's dead now. Wow. That's exactly what happened. That day I did exactly what I've done every day of, uh, on that movie. Which is what? Which is that there's an armorer there, and, and that word is new to me. In the years I've been in this What did you call it? It was a prop guy or woman. And the prop person would come and sometimes they would insist on demonstrating for you and the camera crew. They take the gun, if it was a contemporary gun, they show you the chamber, they show you the clip, they say, the gun is cold. And you look at it and go, thank you. And in the 40 years- Sometimes that would happen. Not all the time. Well, but no, no, sometimes they wouldn't demonstrate to me. Some insisted on demonstrating. They would do the demonstration for everybody there right before we rolled the camera. Backpedaling again from Alec in this area with his stuttering and stammering that we know is caused by agitation, frustration, and everything else that goes in with that. And so we just see Alec fall apart in this interview. This was the worst idea for him to do. There's very little of this left, and this has been such a long video. Thank you for your patience. Welcome to the longest video of 2022 probably, but you know, here, let's continue on. Or rehearsed. 
Then there were others who they didn't do that because I trusted them to do the job. And again, this is not just me pointing a gun at somebody else, people pointing guns at me. I've gotten shot and killed in films before where people had to shoot a flash round at me and I trusted them to do their job. And in the 40 years I've been in this business, all the way up until that day, I never had a problem. How many times do you think you handled a gun in those 40 years? Oh God, I don't know. I don't know. So he says, I don't know in this. And we know earlier that he thinks he is just the most rootinest, hootinest gunslinger ever known to man, just always at his fingertips. He's an old school actor after all, but now he doesn't know how many times he's used a gun. And now, so here's the question that many people have in regards to this, like, oh, well, the guns are pointed at me as well, is that, well, I, honestly though, Alec, the interesting thing is that she was the only one who died along with two other accidental things and you were never ever even one aware of it or two at fault of any of it. So that's very interesting there, Alec. And that's where a lot of people are wondering if maybe Alec is more sinisterly involved than he is. I don't think there's enough to say, but let's keep watching. What, what amazes me is how many bullets, how many rounds of bullets do you believe have been fired on the sets of movies and TV shows in the last 75 years? No idea. Right, it could even be, be above a billion. You've had hundreds and hundreds of millions of bullets fired on the sets of films and TV shows, and four or five people were killed. Now those deaths are, are, are tragic and abhorrent. And believe me, I would do anything in my power. I would do anything in my power to undo what was done. I don't know how that bullet arrived in that gun. I don't know. Mm. So now he's tried to use math to kind of excuse away the fact that Hutchins is dead. Oh, well, there's just so many other bullets out there and like lots of accidents that, you know, there's only a few deaths and yeah, Hutchins is one of them, but you know, mathematically it's fine, right? And then he tries to backtrack by being like, oh, but I would, I would do any, I'm super, I am super emotional about it. You, trust me, I am. And then they edit it. And I don't know that he uses the word but in there, but I find it interesting that he's saying, and no, I would never do blah, 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 blah. And then it cuts. I don't know how that bullet got in there. So then he uses a but, which once again, in terms of an apology or anything along those lines, the but is making an excuse for the behavior. And in this situation, it's no different. Now, it could be a valid excuse, but I don't know how it got in there. And once again, in that narrative, Alex just very, very simple and very, very neglectful with his firearms. So that's our that's our best case scenario still that Alec is really hanging his his mantle on is that he's simple and neglectful, but that's good. But I'm all for doing anything that will take us to a place where we're, it's, this is less likely to happen again. How do you respond to actors like George Clooney who say that every time they were handed a gun, they checked it themselves? Well, there were a lot of people who felt it necessary to contribute some comment to the situation, which really didn't help the situation at all. You have your, if, if your protocol is you check the gun every time, well, good for you. Good for you. Many people who have safe practices approached me and called me out for not being safe. But you know what? That's not helpful. If you have safe book good practices, good for you. I'm gonna have bad not safe practices. That's good for me. Is that his argument right now? Is that what he's going with? Is if, if other talent is being like, no, dude, be safer. We're safer, everybody else is safer, be safer. His response is, no, that works good for you. Safety works for you, not for me. I take it back, maybe Alec is that simple. I'm not sure. You know what I mean? I probably handled weapons as much as any other actor in films with, with an average career. Again, shooting or being shot by someone. And in, in, in that time, I had a protocol and it never let me down. Why did you choose in your 40 years not to check the gun yourself? What I was taught by someone years ago was, as I said, if I, if I took a gun, and I popped a clip out of a gun or I manipulated the chamber of a gun, they would take the gun away from me and redo it. The prop person said, don't do that, when I was young. And they'd say, one thing you need to understand is we don't want the actor to be the last line of defense against a catastrophic breach of safety with the gun. My job, they told me, man or woman, my job is to make sure the gun is safe and then I hand you the gun and I declare the gun safe. The crew's not relying on you to say that it's safe. 
They're relying on me to say that it's safe. When that person who was charged with that job handed me the weapon, I trusted them and, and I never had a problem. With and this was... <laughs> so his reasoning is, is that one time, a long time ago, one armorer said, no, you should never touch the gun. So that's all that Alec ever needed to hear ever again throughout all of his acting career to never touch the weapon himself. And then that, that was his law from that point on, despite apparently it, as, as shown by many other Hollywood talent, it apparently not being the case often on sets, at least where they're involved. So I don't know, Alec, that's not, that's still not a good response of a guy once told me years and years and years and years ago that I shouldn't, so I just never bothered. Like, just because, just because one person tells you to not check the chamber of a weapon, you're gonna you're gonna hang all of your safety off of that for the rest of all of time. Okay, all right, all right, Al, good. From the beginning of your career, but from day one, there's one person that's supposed to make sure that what is in the gun is right and that it's, what's wrong is not in the gun. One person has that responsibility to maintain the gun. And what is the actor's responsibility? Pause. Important, biggest question here. What is the actor's responsibility? How Alec responds to this will let us know. Is he or is he not feeling guilty about this? Just based off of the loose and fairly inaccurate pop psychology thing of how he divvies out the repercussions for the actions done. Now, once again, this isn't actually knowing. Like I said, this is a pop psychology fake sort of thing. It's not a law, but it can be fairly telling and it is at least food for thought. So we'll see how that works in just a teeny tiny moment, but I will let you know here that wrapping up this interview, or at least what I could find of it, Alec has now shifted blame to everyone, including the person who has shot herself and any other possible team member that he could think of to blame shift other than himself, including some guy that gave him bad gun advice years ago. So that's what he's done just now. Now let's hear what, what sentence should be given to an actor in his position. Like what, what is the actor's responsibility really? I, I guess that's a, that's a tough question because the actor's responsibility going this day forward is very different than it was the day before that. Yeah, now, now I can't, first of all, I can't imagine I'd ever do a movie that had a gun in it again. And um, I can't. When you say, what is the actor's responsibility? The actor's responsibility is to do what the prop armorer tells him to do. And we did not have a problem. I mean, I understand there was an accidental discharge at one point on the set of a blank round, but we did not have a problem for me until that day. Everything gets slowed down. It's a Pruder film-esque here. And the issue with that is, is there's only one question to be resolved, only one. That is, where did the live round come from? All right, Alec. That's, that's Alec's question, so that's how this wraps up. This is what I was able to find from ABC and the context delivered. So once again, at the very end, when asked what is the actor's responsibility in this situation, Alec realizes that he is now in a corner. He cannot say it was the actor's responsibility because he has admitted fault. So he decides not to answer. He just says, you know what? That's a great question. That's a hard one. I can tell you from now on out, I, I might not act with guns again. And what is the actor's responsibility? To, to follow the rules. Hmm. I don't know, Alec. I kind of disagree. So now let's, let's look back at everything that we saw from Alec in his history, his past, how he has always behaved and composed himself, what he did in this instance, and then we can kind of talk about everything. So non-verbally speaking, throughout his history, Alec does have a, a tendency, even down to being required legally to seek help, professional help, he has a tendency to overreact angrily and physically in response to anybody kind of pushing back at him. That was also shown in this interview while the interviewer challenged Alec on one of his approaches to stuff. We heard rage and saw rage enter into Alec's demeanor when he's, he's confronted about something. So we know that Alec can be violent and that he can be rather illogically so. So that's who we're working with 
just as a, a base character here. He also has a tendency to be verbally abusive and very outright so. He's done so very publicly in very public ways to many different people in very inexcusable ways, including not the least of which was that audio leak of that voicemail to his own daughter who was a child at the time. So we know that he's verbally abusive, he's physically abusive, he has a short temper, and he doesn't understand, or at least at the time of having Ireland, he didn't understand the basic necessities of parenting. And then we get to this situation here on the Rust set, to where it's a short, short budget, right? It's a short filming thing, so we've got a very compact schedule, a very low budget, and we have a very unsteady, angry, rather volatile director who is in charge of everything. And there are issues, as reported by the crew, that aren't being spoken of. There aren't good living conditions, the prop master is being overstretched, there are safety issues regularly throughout the set, people are feeling overworked, and Alec tries to say that that's just due to the part of the biz, man. It's just indie filmmakers, which could be true, except that all of the safety protocols that were cut eventually ended up in somebody dying, and that's not excusable. That's unfortunate. And so he tried to shift blame over to the indie filmmakers. He did try to shift blame over to the director herself, as, as if it were her fault that she told him to do that, and he tried to manipulate us with his emotional statements. We saw him set the scene for himself emotionally. We saw him force emotion. We saw him divert attention from the issues at hand while always, always, always maintaining this I don't want to be a victim but feel sorry for me attitude to get to the very, very end of things. Now, as I was saying throughout this video, there are two options that really kind of seem to be prevalent here. One is that Alec is extremely simple. He doesn't have the brain capacity to figure out that stuff is going on, to understand prop safety despite being in the business for however many years and however many weapons he's worked with. He doesn't have that understanding about him. Along with that, he's very willing to forego safety things for the sake of words said ages and ages and ages ago, which we figured out. He doesn't want to take any criticism from anybody and he lashes out angrily at anybody who ever criticizes him. So if we take that to a set itself, the best case scenario is that an accidental round was loaded somehow by an overworked crew member, that a negligent DP, ADP, declared a gun cold, and that a negligent Alec Baldwin took the guy's word for it, didn't check the weapon and pointed a possible firearm at another human being, even though he was instructed to. He pulled back a hammer on an old revolver and just released it, which should never, ever be done. It's just, just don't. And he did so while pointing it at another person. So at very, very best, Alec is a simple, negligent, unintentional killer at very best. And while, while a killer, if it were unintentional and negligent, then it's not a criminal case in that he didn't premeditate it, but he still ended a life. Those of you who are legal, you can let me know. How, do, how would that play out? At, at very best, Alex just negligent with what he does. At very worst, there's something far more sinister and the word of the faulty DP who said, yes, actually, the, 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 or actually, I believe it was the attorney of, of Dave, the one who declared the gun cold, said that the, the finger of Alec was not on the trigger. He confirmed that. And to me, I was like, that's who you're going with is the, the, the attorney of the other person who might be at fault here said that, no, he's fine. I don't know if I would want to buy that. I don't find it as the most credible source. It seems like they have a lot to lose in that situation and not much to gain by admitting that perhaps there was some negligence there. So I just find that very interesting. In my opinion, I, I personally think that Alec is just a terrible, 
ignorant human being who caused the death of a very, very promising cinematographer out of negligence, lack of safety, and selfishness. That's what I believe Alec to be. Those are my reasons. I don't think that he should be criminally charged from what I was able to track down, but it's unexcusable. It's absolutely unexcusable. And the damage that he tried to do by dumping all of the blame on anyone else that he could find is disgusting to me. So that's my opinions on Alec Baldwin. Let me know yours in the comments below. Did I miss something while I was going through this and trying to make sure that I gathered everything? If there is any other information that I've missed that you think would actually be helpful to adding clarification either to myself or to some of the people viewing this, let me know in the comments below if you can add links to that. That would be cool as well. And along with that, on the links note, on a much lighter note, please consider following the links in the description of this video to go over to my other channel and to my wife's channel as we will be uploading more content over there. We do have our own combined channel as well and that one's kind of up in the air because we're very busy and we started it without really having the time to so here we are but if you would like to be able to do that please consider doing that hit the like button hit subscribe do all those things i have a patreon blah 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 but but without further ado that's all that i got for today my name is logan and you have been oh so awesome as you always are and i will see you in the next video cheers guys